Thank you for being here. We are thrilled to have the Transatlantic Art Discourse exhibition at One Gallery Sofia. This is the second exhibition of this exhibition exchange project. Uh, we are thrilled to have the support of the US Embassy in Bulgaria for this uh, cultural exchange project and uh, to have all these artists from the United States be here with us. I'd like to share a little bit about the history of this project. The first exhibition was at Lagonia Gallery in Boston with artists from Bulgaria uh, that were invited by the two curators, Gillian Stefano, who is uh, the vice director of the Art Gallery in Sofia, and um, myself. Uh, my name is Elena Fetiba, and I'm an associate professor of painting and drawing at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Um, we have the pleasure of having uh, this second exhibition at One Gallery, Sophia, Brian McFarlane, Anthony Fisher, Brad Abercourt, and Steven Stefanov, and Suzanne Shearson. We have almost all the artists here with us in Sophia, with the exception of Suzanne Shearson, who will be joining us with a pre-recorded lecture on her, on her work. Uh, the presentation. Um, this has been a really special and very important project for us to be able to realize. We postponed it for two, two years because of the pandemic, but we persisted and uh, again we are thrilled to have that come together in such a way with the wonderful exhibition catalog and uh, get all the artists here together um, in an exhibition that explores the moment, the contemporary moment of now to, through the individual prism and um, voice and um, vision of and all these different artists that work in a range of um, working abstraction, representation, invention and metaphor. I have taken um, images based on um, water element, the way, different ways in which water manifests in terms of uh, what we take for granted, the rain that falls, the ocean we kind of walk, you know, we come out of our mother's womb and then we walk out and we see the ocean. Oh, you know, we're all wonderful. And all these things, I think. And I had the opportunity to work with some scientists and to collaborate with them and to, at MIT and to hear, hear their views and to look at their data and discuss their data. And these were oceanographers. And I remember that in a profound way informed a lot of what I started with about 10 years ago. Um, so I started to reflect. Um, on not only the deep ocean or water element, but sonics of sound and color. Color, I think, has a lot to do with sound. Um, I think psychologically, I can hear sound through color, color, basically. I think people like Kandinsky and so on were able to do that. And, um, and finally, um, these works are meant to be somewhat simple, um, taking a simple element of rain, um, marks, mark making when it comes to the formal aspect, and create a simple abstract painting with minimal, a minimal use of, 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 of a certain kind of line or uh, linear direction about how these lines relate to each other, or marks, and to conjure up temperature. Because I think, the information and what we, 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 we make, our narratives come from that embodiment that we have had since childhood, yeah. and possibly um, beyond childhood, maybe coming from our grandparents and our ancestors, you know, uh, the young, young theory of archetypes, you know, the, the idea that things might come a certain knowledge to us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there are a lot of things stored up that, that we can work from. We don't have to be conscious of those things. 
much information and, and mark and uh, imagery comes from not necessarily logical philosophical so ideas. They're, they come from very unconscious ideas as well. And, and it's a lot of information. Yeah. Well, so you, you just have to find a way to unlock it and to start shaping it into it. Yes. And then when you finish them, you say, oh, that's yeah. what it yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the rain falls and we try to catch it with a container. Yeah. I was looking at a museum with the containers that were at the museum today. And we, 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 we make something to contain something that is transcendental. The idea of nature and, and his phenomenal things that take place in nature. <coughs> we want to contain it, so we make a, a jug. Yes. Or we create a vase and, and we have this thing, we catch the water. And I think in a way, um, the painting becomes that kind of conduit. It becomes a, the, the, the canvas becomes this, this way of containing that universe. Yeah, well, the best of, 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 yeah. of feelings, yeah. of intuitions, of, of intuition, yeah. of, 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 of the literature we've read, the, the conversation we've had, the, um, the fears and the emotion, the temperature that we've felt, the cold and the warm, and the, and the shift from you know, one extreme to another, and so on and so forth. And I, I love intuitively. So this type of painting is closer to music, in a sense. That it's more abstract and intuitive rather than... Uh, okay. Yes, it's, it's, it's very linked to music as well. I, I listen to a lot of very interesting music when I paint. Yeah. Maybe begin by just saying seven years ago, my work, uh, my methods of working went through a profound change when I uh, had to have two surgeries on both ankles, well, a surgery for each, to fuse my ankles. And so I couldn't, I, I couldn't ambulate or move around very easily for a long time. So uh, I started inventing new ways of making things, yeah, just out of curiosity, like a chair with wheels, and I started making other types of simple, heavy pieces of equipment that would make lines, almost like printmaking. Um, and more increasingly, I started inviting all this randomness into my work, and it became important to me to invite as many shapes and marks into a piece as possible in the quickest time possible. So I started even working with very large magnets and big handfuls of pens and other kinds of ways to make marks. So um, there's a whole variety of things that I've done. I've, sw I've had pendulums swinging around with wiring pans and painting, all kinds of stuff. But I, I don't mean to say that it's all random because I very thoughtfully uh, edit things later on. But I did find in getting to these pieces that even though I was inviting randomness into the work at first, I was still coaxing the randomness into certain configurations and certain patterns, and I discovered that this kind of pattern is there, and that's what it is. I've been drawn sort of compulsively to film with my phone, uh, vortices in water, like whirlpools, or things in the air, with dust, or plant forms that do this, or fireworks, or pictures of neutrinos and hydrogen, frozen hydrogen or helium, I don't know. Just photographs I find. So this kind of pattern is sort of reasserting itself off and over and over again in the big work. So these are sort of small templates giving me an idea, a direction about what the big work is trying to do. Some of these are literally um, composites of photographs I've taken of three-dimensional things I've made with, with plant forms and things, linear things that I've then photographed and even sometimes cut into to make sense of, to discover what it's after. Brian was very clear as to how he works his process and you started hinting as to how you came to this technique. But I'm interested in the first step. What is the first moment when you think, okay, there is an image here? Mm. Well, the first one is usually not about image. It's, wow. it's just like I, I'm trying to kind of unburden. I don't want an image at first. Really? But, but these are these are all very similar. These are sort of almost like explosions. Yeah. Or, or what often things do in nature yeah. um, from a central vortex or something. But um, I, I try to uh, invite things to happen. I wish I could show you this short film I have where I'm actually even inside of a big sonal tube with the magnets and forming paint on the outside of it and doing things. Yeah. Um, 
But nonetheless, within this random thing, like I said, I generally start arriving at certain symmetries and rhythms within the marks. So what that evoke say? states, evoke things like that. So, so would you say this is also a very intuitive way of working with the medium? Definitely. So you don't rationalize it, you just try, you're attracted to this form. Yeah. You saw all these variations in your play. Yes. Yeah. And I find this form actually in many artists that I admire. I, th I mean, it, I, when I look at work, I start to identify certain things. Leonardo da Vinci did certain drawings and yes. the books that remind you. He, he does vortex as well. Lots of things like that. Water, fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics, winds, yes. uh, water, yeah. plant forms, plant forms, weeds, you know. It does the universe. Makes <laughs> exactly. So a few things about my work. Um, I've always loved painting. The big hook for me is making um, paint look like something. That's the thing that hooked me from the very beginning. Um, using color to describe light and shadow, to describe a form and space. This is the thing, this is magic to me being able to do this. And I was pretty good at it, so it kind of sucked me in. And um, that's been painting role for a long time, centuries. And even now, in beginning courses, that's what you're taught how to create an illusionistic image um, with this material. So it's the thing that hooked me, but the big dilemma for me, and I think the big dilemma for most painters, um, it was evident from the beginning, is what to paint. I'm loving to do this and construct this. My thoughts were, I, I don't want to you know, necessarily change into something where I wouldn't be doing this. Um, but at the same time, being in the contemporary world and realizing that art has really you know, just opened up and all different sorts of things are happening, I realized um, within that space, I still want to paint things and get that kind of satisfaction from making something look like something, and also have my work be about that. So a challenge for me is what to paint, I started to, I think mostly in the beginning intuitively, thinking about what could I paint that isn't so charged that it becomes less about painting and more about the thing, the signifier, the thing that's in the painting. And I, I think intuitively I sort of withdrew from anything overly political, anything overly, um, you know, having some sort of social commentary, something dealing with identity. I, I, I withdrew from that and intuitively started looking at very common sort of things in my environment and, and decided to paint these things. Um, it seemed at that point, uh, the more common, the more overlooked, the more imperfect, the more confident I became that that's what I wanted to paint. Um, and not just wanting to paint it, but somehow elevate it, draw people's attention to um, these unconventional beauties that are always around us that we kind of walk through and ignore. And to do it in such a way that it sort of commanded that attention. And, you know, it's evolved over time in these days um, I'm still drawn to the same subject matter, but now I'm even more increasingly diving into the depths of perception and how I look at something and how I construct something and have them even more linked, um, which has you know, led me into all sorts of um, very, very critical observations and how to calculate uh, how I'm seeing something and, and assembling those measurements to construct an image. Um, and, and I think that the, the reason that the subject matter has stayed so consistent over my time is that um, it's allowing me to do those things, show those things, uh, while at the same time having a dialogue with painting, most of the surfaces that I'm painting, whether it be an object, a floor, or even within space, have histories. They have histories of mark making, and, um, those are sort of a lot of times undeliberate and just accumulation over time. Um, but I love describing those things in paint, just like at the beginning, 
um, describing an object and having it convincingly look like that object. Um, these days, it's, it's you know, I, when I decide on something, um, usually it takes, sometimes it's in my space for a couple of years before I actually decide to commit to make a painting of it. Um, sometimes it's quicker. Uh, I sort of see the painting in my head. I can see it as a painting, and that is, you know, sort of the key for me to begin the painting. Um, I know it will be successful in the end, and I have an idea that it will be successful in the end. Um, and, uh, but more so, like, the strategy for constructing it has changed over time, and it's just getting more and more critical about, again, my perception. Um, and how I'm observing something, and how to put that together in a static image on a two-dimensional plane. And it's all three dimensions, and you're looking at it over there, you're looking at it here, you're looking at it there, and trying to assemble the whole thing on in a single image without fracturing it. Something uh, that I think connects um, connects us and connects me with all all the artists and um, in our own very distinct way, it's this um, search of our individual state um, as the, as an artist and our response to what is happening around us. Um, but each one of us, as a human being and as an artist, he has a very different way of expressing this, um, which, again, as an image, is a completely different um, way of um, delivery that each one of us has and a different voice and different vision. So what I try to find in my work, what I seek in my work, is to construct images that uh, create distilled representations of different states. And they may be individual states, they may be social states and global states. Um, and I, I try to use images and to work with images not as representations of things, but I want my subject to be, become a metaphor for something else beyond the subject itself. In a way to gently point the viewer in the direction of where I'd like them to come and explore and decode um, the subtle meanings embedded in the work. I'm never, I'm very wary of the literal and the explicit, so sometimes I wonder, am I too subtle? Is, am I even understood as to what, what these works mean to me and what I want them to, to mean? But I, I hope that, um, when the viewer spends time reflecting the work, it's much quieter work that they do uh, receive and take away um, what, what the work is about to me as an artist. So this, this piece is called uh, uh, Ash or Petal in Bulgarian. And to, to me, Ash is what is left in the end. It's of an individual, but also of a world. Of a, of a place. Um, it's very beautiful, but there is something very somber about it. Um, ash is also the material that the work is created by, it's charcoal. So the material itself, in a way, becomes metaphor. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the scale of the work is very important to me. I want to draw in the viewer. I, I want to create a very intimate experience for the viewer, so they're not very large pieces. I want to draw draw in um, the person to come and experience the piece from up close, so the intricacy of the image is very important to me, and it does become a very meditative process when I construct the works myself. It takes me hours and hours, and I just get lost in the abstraction that constructs the representation of the image. Something else that um, I consider important is decontextualizing the image as a way to underscore that this is not a pile of ash in a landscape or in a room. It's a pile of ash that is a metaphor for something else. Whether it's a global state or an environmental state, an environmental crisis, or 
the conflicts that are happening between different um, <clears throat> countries in the world or uh, social issues. Um, what is left after everything that has happened that we nearly have no control over, whether it's in our personal lives or um, in, um, yeah, in, in the context of social states. Um, <clears throat> I, um, drawing has become more and more my medium of choice. I'm also a painter. I also have started to work in installation, but I always come back to drawing as the, it feels like it's the core, the simplest way to convey, to attempt to convey uh, something really meaningful. I always try to um, narrow down and to become as concise as possible and try to deliver with as little as possible uh, uh, something that they hope is a powerful experience uh, or meaningful experience for the viewer. A, a dream of solitary space is kind of contradictory at this moment. Um, in quarantine, I spent so much more time with those I cared for uh, that moments of solitude felt really rare and incredible. Um, and so in these paintings, I am um, thinking of different mothers or caretakers that I know, and um, I'm trying to invent them a space or create a space for them. Um, and sometimes um, the landscape kind of interferes with the space or the two blend. Sometimes the, the women kind of expand or grow out of this space. Um, so the space is not entirely fixed because I do want it to be more psychological than physical, uh, this, this little space that I'm painting. Um, and that it really is so much more about um, reflection and refueling as a place to, to reflect and refuel rather than a, a point of escape. Um, and, and that's very important to me in the work as well. Um, this is actually where I painted as well. I painted in my basement during quarantine. Um, and so there were these low level windows at the, at the ground level um, that as time went on, so many dandelion weeds and different weeds would kind of grow in front of them, um, making these beautiful curtains actually. Um, and the garden feels like an apt metaphor uh, for, for the studio for me as well. Um, and so I made this image called Janice's Midnight Garden, um, imagining uh, a gardener that I know uh, who is kind of emerging from these weeds. She's camouflaged in with, with all of the, uh, these, these life-size weeds um, as she's trying to move up to this, to navigate, you know, to this space that's um, looming in the distance, this, this little structure. Um, and uh, in dig site, uh, this particular painting, a friend had, had said, well, what about a studio or a creative space that just doesn't feel accessible right now? It feels so far in the distance. You know you're going to get there, but you have no idea when. And um, I wanted to make this painting to kind of hold space uh, for that, that idea, um, for a studio that's out of reach or looming in the distance. Um, and I think about the way that, that time um, condenses itself in, in motherhood. It often compresses the past um, and the future um, because it, it reminds you of, of all of these um, other times as you watch a child grow, you think of, of younger years. Um, and then you're spending so much time thinking about how certain things you do are going to affect the, the future development of this child too. Um, and so uh, it, it's unclear in this painting, you know, if the building is going to be built uh, or if it's the remains of a building that's passed. 